it's about rediscovery. Self-acceptance to me is about things that you know about yourself that you have to rediscover that the world kind of take, takes away from you, like your childhood dreams or uh, what you think beauty is or what you think success is. That was a hard one for me because part of me not accepting myself was <clears throat> I had to accept the fact that my version of success and other people's version of success are two totally different things. Mm -hmm. And I'm cool with that. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I've been fired up about this interview for a while now. I'm super stoked to have both uh, Claude Kelly and Chuck, Chuck Harmony from Lewis York with me today. So I wanted to just start off by saying thanks for taking the time to uh, spend with me today, y'all. Thanks yeah, for having man. us, man. It's good, good to be here. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So like, I, like I told you guys beforehand, I saw you guys at the TEDx Nashville um, coming up on a year now back in May of 2019 and was inspired by you guys and kind of your, your unique message and your unique story and mission mm -hmm. um, ever since then. So I know I wanted to have you guys on the show. So I'm super excited to dive into a lot of just kind of what you guys are up to. But I want to start off with a little bit more of the background. Mm -hmm. So I know that um, you're from New York City mm -hmm. and you're from St. Louis. So the yeah, East combination Louis. of Lewis, York. Yep. 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 Um, and so I just kind of want to start with you guys were frustrated kind of with the music industry a little bit, and that's one of the reasons that sparked you guys to, to form Lewis York. So mm -hmm. I want you to just talk about the decision behind that and the motivating factor behind coming together as Lewis York. Yeah. Well, we were both living in New York City at the time uh, in a studio in, in Times Square, and we were having a fantastic career. I mean, mm -hmm. we were literally up to the, to the day we created Lewis York working with the cream of the crop of the record industry of artists that were coming into the studio. So it wasn't about there being like a, a drop in interest. I think the calls we were getting and the artists that were being signed and sent to us were uninspiring. Um, they weren't asking us to be creative. They're asking us to mimic ourselves and other people. So we were just going to quit because we felt like we, Chuck and I really, 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 really love music right. mm -hmm. like to the core. And so it's not just about a check for us. It's about preserving the art, pushing it forward, um, being really intentional. So we just felt like we were out of place. Mm. And so rather than take up space, we're like, let's just quit. And I think we had a real conversation about that in the studio. And he said he was going to quit. And I said I was going to quit. And it sounded crazy to each other. I think at that point, we just made the decision to convince the other person not to quit. And the best way to convince them is to show them how good music mm -hmm. yeah. so I'm like well I'll write some songs so you can realize it and he's like well I'll produce these songs so you can realize that you shouldn't quit and that ended up being the sound that became Lewis York and then when that happened we realized oh we've refound our excitement and a, and a new way to do this and so that just created a new mission for us yeah. Yeah. and and it turned our life around not just musically but physically and spiritually and we grew up we grew up and when you grow up you make you you have to make grown up decisions which means that you don't quit you just find a way to make sure that all parts of you are being fulfilled mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you guys think you would have quit it wasn't if it wasn't for the other one yes definitely definitely, yeah. definitely. i would not be here i would probably be in india somewhere eating rice <laughs> <laughs> and praying and trying to find yeah. myself yeah because you were going to go to a seminary yeah. and you were going to go to religious, yeah I'd, I'd probably be some, i'd definitely be in europe somewhere just like I don't know, but it, I definitely was. Un we're not afraid to take risks, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been afraid to quit. I just know now that it wasn't the right. It wouldn't have been the right decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you guys were both going to do like something kind of religious. You were going to go into seminary, mm -hmm. and you were going to go do religious study or study religious studies, right? Yeah, but I, I think I think Chuck and I are both trying to find ourselves or just find a, a deeper purpose. Mm -hmm. And so it's it made sense. Yeah. yeah so and one of, so one of the things that y'all's kind of mission is is to get a, a group of people who are very into kind of like promoting self-acceptance mm -hmm. and that sort of thing so were you guys kind of like you said you were trying to find yourself were mm -hmm. you going through a, a struggle with self-acceptance or what exactly did that <clears throat> journey for yourself look like at that point in time i think it was trying to accept the fact that you didn't fit in that was it, it was really hard because we were in the room with the cool kids so we were in the room with all the celebrities and so when you don't fit into that, that mo in that room, then you're like, am I the weird one? Am I the, mm. the off one? You mm. know what I'm saying? And so just learning how to accept that. So you said it was, you know, you were kind of the, the weirdo in the room, if you yeah, will. And, um, just, and just learning how to accept that that's okay. So and it's okay for you. You know what I'm saying? So 
right? So what was that process like? Like, how did you get, get to the point of now I can accept myself? Like, was it kind of being able to talk to each other about it? Or like, what, how, how, did, how did you get to the point of increased self-acceptance? I think it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm. It's a process. And for us, the mu- creating the music, uh, producing the music, writing the lyrics, arranging the music, recording it, came with a series of revelations. Mm. Not just in the studio, but the, the time spent outside of the studio, just even thinking about what you're writing and the responsibility it, 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 it has. So like, we, we would do these songs and like you would almost be in disbelief that, that it came out. The songs were almost ahead of the life of the life change. And so you'd hear the song like, whoa. Uh, and then you, it forces you to think differently, go to work out a little harder. Cause you know, you have, now you have this thing that's, that you want to make sure you take care of and you want to be your best self for it. Mm-hmm. And it makes you want to have the spiritual backing to, to stand behind those lyrics and those melodies. And it makes you want to, uh, rethink how you present yourself and who you associate with. Mm-hmm. So was it, it, it sounds like to me, and, and tell me if it's, is this isn't the right interpretation. It sounds like to me, like when you guys would produce something really great in your eyes, that was super unique to you. Mm-hmm. That was like, this is super cool. Like that's helped you with the self acceptance kind of thing. absolutely. And it's also the first time, or this that phase was the first time that we both invested in doing music for ourselves. Anyway, mm-hmm. so we never had to really change. We were always about Chuck and I are really good at taking on someone else's, for lack of a better word, brand and polishing it or making it new or making it better. And so it was always about us creating something and giving it to, for example, you. Mm-hmm. And now you have to go live with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And go make be be your best self with this with this really great music. We kind of did it. We did it to ourselves. And so, not only was it heavy because we get. We, I think we gave ourselves the most potent music, like the most heavy music, mm-hmm. the most deep music. But because we take it seriously, a lot of it was our frustration with other musicians and artists that don't live their work. We didn't want to make that same mistake. Yeah. So it was important to us to be a living example of what we were saying. So those first songs that came out, like Slow Motion and Hipsters and Things I Should Have Said and Claire Huxwell, those first songs that we when we introduced Lewis York were pretty bold, a pretty bold statement about who you should be. And we knew that if it was going to be real, we would have to be that ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so you put yourself through it. And he pushed me a lot. And when I was uncomfortable and I was fighting back and vice versa, and you bring each other along until you get somewhere. And I'm not sure we could have done it as successfully I know we would have gotten there individually because we're both pretty ambitious people, but I think the, the tag team effort allowed us to get there a little faster and realize that we weren't crazy mm-hmm. in the process. Do you think that's kind of like a, a lesson in terms of like advice for other people to get more self-accepted of themselves is to like maybe figure out what it is that like is super unique to you, super special about you and like find a way to do your best in that particular area and like see it as great or what's like, what's the piece of advice to somebody else to be like, if you're not accepting yourself, here's what I would tell you to start doing. Yeah. It's a good question. I think, and I can only speak from my experience, but I think it's about rediscovery. Self-acceptance to me is about things that you know about yourself that you have to rediscover that the world kind of takes takes away from you, like your childhood dreams or uh, what you think beauty is or what you think success is. That was a hard one for me because part of me not accepting myself was I had to accept the fact that my version of success and other people's version of success are two totally different things. Mm -hmm. And I'm cool with that. You know what I'm saying? And so those kinds of things, I just feel like that leads to that self acceptance. Once once you rediscover, go back to the beginning and rediscover. Yeah. And I I really like what, what you just said there, like how because the version of success that society creates or that a lot of people create isn't what success should look like mm-hmm. for everybody. And I've thought a lot about that myself and trying not to get caught up in being upset that I'm not successful in a in maybe a way that other people say it's successful, but mm-hmm. I'm successful in the way that I say I'm successful, so that's good enough for me. So yeah. I, love, I love that message. And, and we, I mean, Chuck and I have been around a lot of people that the world considers successful. And what you don't see is that a lot of them are unhappy. Mm-hmm. So money doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you are successful. 
Um, if you're not happy with yourself and you're not content with who you are, mm. um, neither does fame, neither do rec- record sales or charts or fashion or looks. None of that stuff necessarily guarantees your happiness. And so it's not about you chasing someone else's accomplishments or even the accomplishments you're making up in your head that may seem far-fetched. It's about, I personally think, on top of what, you, of what Chuck said, is... Finding the thing that you're not, not, not even that you're good at, but finding the thing that you love. Mm-hmm. Cause then you'll get good at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's but true. Finding the thing that you love. And, that, like, and if it's music, like it is for us, finding happiness in music does not necessarily mean being famous. It means doing music. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's the misconception is that people think that to be happy in music means that you have to be Beyonce level success. There's lots of mu- school te- music teachers that are teaching elementary piano that are ha- are much happier yeah. than the bigger the same. millions of followers because they're just doing what they love every day. There's people who play one part of one section of an orchestra in a sm- in some town and they're just happy being second violin mm-hmm. because they're getting to express themselves every day. And I think if more people would truly seek out, ignore society about what they think you should be in society and do what you love then whether you become the most famous person at that or or the smallest person in your town doing it, if you're doing what you love, you'll get good at it because you'll do it all the time and you'll find the kind of contentment that you really seek, which is not about fame and money and all that stuff in the first place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think... Um I think that the thought process of trying to figure out what you define as success is super important because I think at such a young age, we seek other what other people say as a success. Because I know like me growing up, like playing sports, it's like, oh, I want to be in the NFL, I want to be in the MLB. Yeah. And it's like you get to a point where you realize it's like, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. like that's not my, my version of success. And I think it is always a balance of like, what you love and what you're good at because most of the time you're not going to love something that you suck at. But, exactly. But, but you want to fail forever. Yeah. yeah exactly. So you're probably going to be relatively proficient at it but exactly. because you love it you're going to get better. Um, but you, but, it, but it really is it really is a a, a, a solo personal soul thing. Like mm-hmm. I'm very fortunate that I, I discovered really young what I was good at. I knew what I, I knew music was my thing early. I know that's not everyone's thing but what I do think everyone has is that feeling mm about whatever they're passionate about, when they get it, whenever they get it. Mm-hmm. For me, it might have been like two or three years old, but I believe that people get that feeling about if they're destined to play baseball or if they're destined to uh, to cook. be to cook or to or medicine. Like there's that feeling that you get when you have locked into what your purpose is, and sometimes people don't listen to it, and other times people don't take the time to find it. But if you can. Your job to me is first to find it, and then after you find it, is to just nurture it until you die. Yeah, mm-hmm. I love that. I can talk about this all day long, <laughs> but I want to. So you guys are both super creative individuals. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you'd you'd uh, you'd agree. So what is the when when what what kind of setting do you think are you most creative in? Like, or do you do you do anything before you go into like, a writing session or in one of these like recording sessions that you try to like? channel the most creative version of yourself possible like when do you think mm. you're most creative hmm. i don't know if it's a time of day I, yeah i'm not I'm, it's not a time of day but i i do um not to be cliche but i do say a prayer before i be creative every time you know what i'm saying whether it's a silent prayer or whether i go in the bathroom and say it out loud i always say a prayer to just because i need i need it to come down yeah the creativity mm-hmm. to come down so that's my ritual. Okay. And, and I, I always feel empowered after it. I also smoke weed. Yeah. So I smoke a little weed too. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it doesn't hurt. I, I think that people think it's just like it's, it's an escapism, yeah. but it's not. It's actually, I mean, of course, it makes you feel great and, and, and it makes music sound better, but really what it is, is it, it helps you to get, remove your ego. Mm-hmm. That's what I like about it, is that all the things that block you from being creative are really like talking yeah. about other societal things. Like, am I is this going to sound cool? Am I cool enough? Will I look good? Who's going to be interested in me? Will I get girls doing this? How am I going to look in the video? What should I be? How should I be standing? And it's all ego, and you mean you'll never get to the art and the poetry and the heart of it. Yeah. So sometimes when I smoke weed, it's literally because it just relaxes my shoulders enough to be like, get it out. Yeah. And then once you get out, then you decide if you want to keep it or not. But you have to get past those ego walls to really get to good art. 
Mm-hmm. I, I love that. I've never thought about it like that before. Um, do you think that, like, how much of, and this could be kind of the creativity or songwriting, kind of the combination of it, how much do you think of that is innate in you, like an innate ability, an innate gift, and how much of that is learned and a skill that you can develop? That's a good question because they kind of just both. It's, it's, it just bleeds in together. Mm-hmm. It's really a combination of both. You don't need skill to do music. There's people that have never taken a voice lesson yeah. who can really sing. Mm-hmm. There's people who have never taken a musical lesson. Chuck's never taken a guitar lesson, but he plays be- or a piano lesson, and he plays better than most people I know. So it's not that you need to go through like a, a formal training, but I do think that there is an innate ability mm-hmm. uh, to express yourself musically that that is that is unique to certain people, and I, and and that's what separates artists and musicians from the rest of the world. We just want to talk about this in the card of the day is that in general, majority of human beings can sing. Mm-hmm. Like human, I say humans are like birds. Like we're we're we you, you can hear them right now. Like humans and birds are made to sing and exp- like they use their voice and express and yell and whisper. That's what we, that's how we communicate. So it's not uncommon for most people in a room. Like you, I said, you go to a stadium mm-hmm. and. You never hear the people that can't sing when the whole crowd is singing because the majority yeah, of the people, people in there can sing. Can sing. Mm-hmm. So that's that's just the base level. Humans can sound good, but but taste and uh, emotion and storytelling and originality and, originality and painting a picture, poetry that is uh, that's a special God given gift right. that not everyone can do. Um, and I, it, it's no different than any other profession. Like, right. also, every, almost everyone can cook too. And there's a reason you go to chefs. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, I, 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 we all can fry eggs, right? right. <laughs> but then you go to Bobby Flay for something like for, for the, the gift. Mm-hmm. You got to go to someone for the gift. Yeah. And that's what I think that we have, and I think that's what um, I mean when I say people need to find that for themselves in their respective field. Yeah. So you talked earlier about kind of the ego and how smoking weed helps you drop mm-hmm. that ego a little bit. And I think one of the people that or one of the things that a lot of people who um, listen to the podcast and the, the audience tells me is one of the skills that they want to have mm-hmm. is to drop caring so much about what other people think about them. Mm-hmm. And I, ob- I obviously think that's a super important skill and you guys would probably agree. But I also think there's kind of also a line of don't care what other people think about you, but there also is some people that you should care mm-hmm. how they think about you. And there are certain times that you should care. Mm-hmm. And so I've, I really thought a, a, hard about where that line is drawn. Mm-hmm. So where do you guys think like maybe we should draw the line between when we should just not care what people think about us versus when we should care or who we should care about? Hmm. That's a good one. And you don't have to come up with like a great answer right off the bat. It's going to be just like a discussion. I mean, I, I, I it's a tough, that's a Chuck. super tough answer. Go ahead, Chuck. Or question. Yeah, it, it is. You know, like for me, the circle of people that I actually care about what they think about me is so small. It's like five fingers. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like my mom, like I care about what she thinks about me and my, my weirdo family. I care about representing them and what they think about me. But for the most part, um, in my mind, and this might sound a little harsh, but how I deal with it is in my mind, I think that everybody is awesome. I think everybody sucks. <laughs> so if, if everybody sucks, then why should I care about if they think I suck or not? We all in this together. And so that's how, how I kind of deal with it. I'm, I'm myself all the time. I'm, I'm unapologetic about who I am and what I believe. And so I feel like it's a hard road, but I feel like if if you realize that nobody's perfect and like I said, everybody's awesome and everybody sucks, I feel like you can you can get somewhere with not caring about what people think. Mm-hmm. You got anything to add? I think I think that um you have a limited amount of time in a day to worry about things, and if you spend that same time worrying about what you think about yourself, then it corrects the problem anyway. Because I always think about like how I want, how I want to see myself behaving, or or if what if what I'm doing today is going to keep me up at night because I feel like it was beneath what 
I, I know it's my best self mm. or my best work or my best level of kindness or understanding. And that keeps me in line far more than what anyone else is thinking about because I know they don't know the bar I have for myself anyway. Mm -hmm. So if I'm disappointing myself, then I, I'm guaranteed that I'm <laughs> that I suck to everybody else. That's guaranteed. Yeah. Um, and that's my that's my barometer. I'm always like my 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 thing every day is to make sure that I'm not disappointing myself. And and for me personally, that's like trying to be as understanding as honest as hardworking as thorough as um good looking I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> no i mean i'm i'm enough of a work of work in progress enough that takes up in my entire day mm -hmm. <laughs> to have to be worried about what everyone else thinks would, would be a, a whole second job i don't have time for yeah right no i think i really like i've never heard it phrased that way before if, if you kind of like Define and it's almost like defining what success is for yourself. And as long as you ask yourself, "Am I, in my eyes, being successful for me?" Mm -hmm. then it doesn't matter, right? What yeah. anybody else says beyond that. Yeah, and plus we gotta stop taking ourselves so seriously. You know, that's that's my thing. Is that when you when you're that worried and concerned about the result, you're taking life too seriously. Mm -hmm. Not, we're not going to make it out of this thing alive. So yeah. there has to be some enjoyment. There has to be some chill with yourself. You have to pat yourself on the back. And celebrate yeah. your wins. Celebrate your wins and laugh at your losses. You know what I'm saying? Because it's your journey. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You, there's, no, there's no master ruler looking down and, 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 and judging your, your journey. It's yours and yours alone. So. Mm -hmm. the, weird, the weirdest thing ever is that like, we all grow up and we get really advanced. You start studying all this advanced theory and philosophy and religion and all that stuff. But if you go back to the stuff they were telling you when you were a kid that you forget, it's, that's just what it is. Like that's like we spend, we end up spending our whole life trying to love ourselves and worry about whatever else. And Dr. Seuss was telling you like way back in the day, all of them were just like, Hey, Hakuna Matata, or like you are you. There's no one more better than you. No, no one can be more you than you. All that kind of stuff. And it's funny how like, it's funny how like you. I believe that you're born with that knowledge, and then everything about the world strips that from you. Mm. And so your job really is to go. Is not learning. It's remembering mm. what you knew when you were a baby. I like that because babies don't give a f about anything. <laughs> That's true. They're kind of just in there, like they're. They're just in there. They're not worried about. They're not vain. They're not. Worried. They're just. They're, they want to be. They want to eat. They want to be happy. They want to be loved. They want to learn, all that stuff. And then the world beats up on you and and puts all these extra pressures and all these new ex expectations. And the rest of your life, you're trying to strip strip those away and get back to the, the purest form of yourself, which is, before and, you learned all that crap. Yeah. All that and, programming. And not and and and, I dare not minimize that, um, this whole scenario because. It took me a long time to get there, and it's, yeah. it's really hard, man. Like daily, there's a million things that that remind you that you shouldn't be you. Daily, like on the internet, on social media, more than ever, and marketing, just going to the grocery store, in mm -hmm. the gym, like just everywhere. And so, I, I I don't minimize that because that that really is one of the hardest things in life. Yeah. I completely agree. It's it's almost it's impossible to shut it all out. Right. But like you said, there are so many things that are telling you kind of not to be you to, in a certain sense, and just trying to like almost like acknowledging that out loud right. and realizing like this is telling me not to be me. Like I'm not going to listen to it. Is I think is mm -hmm. really important. So you guys came out with a new album back in October, American Griots. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to tell just start off talking about kind of a little bit about the just kind of the background of it and and why you guys are you know so excited about it and what and what the message is mm -hmm. with the album the album is awesome it's called american it's hot Grilles. it's hot <laughs> it's hot did you get it uh, it's american griots and like everything else we do it is our music and our life always are this are moving simultaneously so it's great songs but really they're all life lessons and words, people, sounds, places that we've learned along the way. Mm. So um, the word Amer the word griots is a West African term that um we learned we learned right before we started doing the album and it's um basically a griot is a West African poet, musician, storyteller, 
teacher uh, that traveled from town to town, uh, passing along the oral tradition of society. It'd be everything from the gossip to the history to entertainment in this presentation. We read about that and we just loved it. We felt like we were so close. It felt like it felt like our ancestry, which it actually is, and it felt like um, a really good way to explain the spiritual and cultural calling that goes behind why me and Chuck do what we do. Not just for, like I said, the charts and the money, but trying to push culture forward and legacy and information and art and love and all that stuff. Mm. So we wanted to reclaim it and make it our own. So obviously we're not West African, we're American. And not, not a lot of people know what it is. So we want to call ourselves the, the American Griots because it felt like a modernization of this thing. And if, in a lot of ways, if you are a musician that's telling stories and traveling from town to town, then you're a griot. So the album is set up almost like two griots coming to town the way they would mm. and telling this this performance story about loving yourself and um, having fun with no regrets and uh, commenting, like, teach me a song, uh, 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 encouraging people to, to do their best artistic work and encouraging them not to live in regret. Like, how will I feel about that stuff? And the music itself is reminding people to explore everything and not to live in a box. Chuck Lilly does everything. I mean, he, he plays piano, but the arrangements have horns and strings. And we brought all our friends, the Shindellas, and all our friends we met in Nashville along for the ride. It's just our best work yet. And it's uh, who we are and, and where we're going. It's theatrical, but it's super catchy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it, you can. I think in the end you can tell we love music and we love life. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want people to know. Yeah. I hope like, that rubs off. I want the world to know. I, was, I, I want was, the world to know. I was getting ready to say, I think people can definitely hear that through the microphone. That's for sure, that you love music and you love life. Yeah. But, um, is there a song that either of you, ha is there a favorite song in the album for either of you guys? Man. Hmm. It changes every day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, every true. day. Yeah. Today, Chuck, your favorite song? Hmm. Probably Electric Blue. Mm. It just takes me on this journey that I always wanted to go on. It's, it's kind of John Mayer-ish at the beginning, and then it gets to um, Beach Boys and all kind of stuff, and then I, and then it ends with with this jazz horn arrangement. So it just takes me through a whole journey of these life, um, these these points in life musically for me. Mm -hmm. And I would say Velvet. Okay. Uh, for some of the same reasons. It's really musical. It sets a tone. It's a side of us that people don't get to see very often. And uh, it also touches on some of our favorites. It, it has like some Sting, some Sade, mm. some uh, uh, George Michael, um, uh, uh, Quincy Jones. Like There's a lot of feelings in there that um, we, we're missing. And I think the world is missing. And it's poetry, too. So... Today, that's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. Probably change. It'll change in, in five minutes. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So I wanted to bring up one of y'all's singles, um, How Will I Feel? Because mm -hmm. I, I read that it's kind of a single that's trying to evoke a conversation on what activist predecessors would have thought about today's culture. What do you, what, what, talk a little bit about that as to why you wanted to kind of evoke that conversation to use that same term and what you think maybe activist predecessors would think. Oh, you're talking about two different songs, right? Cause you're talking about, that's, I wonder. Okay. Maybe that I, either way. No, I, wonder, I, I, got, I got one. I, got I one. wonder then. Um, okay. So I wonder is about, yeah, I just wrote it down. No, no, it's all good. I wonder, I, I wonder the, the lyrics are, I wonder if Martin was alive now, would he be proud? Mm -hmm. Okay. I wonder if Malcolm was alive now, would he be proud? Uh, These are the things that keep me up at night. That's, yeah, pretty, that's, that's, that, that's pretty much what the sentiment is. And, and Chuck Lilly echoes that scene. I mean, if, if you could, if, if a piano could talk, it, it, what he's playing, it says the exact same thing. And, uh, uh that song is, uh, it's, that song is, of all the songs in the album, that's been the longest work in progress. Mm. We've had that song for the longest and we've tried different ways, performing different ways to, to get to the, the heart of the matter. Um, but that's, it was in, we call it the sermon of the album. It's that somewhere towards the end, after you've had your fun and you got to know us, then we hit you with the, the mean potatoes. And it's purposely questions because we're not preaching and saying like, you know, 
if Martin were here, he'd be pissed off at you right now. <laughs> because like Chuck said, you said like he, we love everyone, but we all suck too. So it's like it's you, there is no answer, but we feel as in we sometimes we call it just posing the question itself. Mm-hmm. Teach these people the lesson. Because we're not telling you that we think you're wrong or that we think you're right. We're saying, just ask yourself that question every day and then go decide what to do with your mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. And that changes how you how you behave with people or what you think is important in life. And that's what we wanted that song to be. So it's much less about the fact that we're necessarily harping on old activists. But we are saying, those two guys or anybody that you, anyone who's your past hero... <laughs> That, that, that's helped you formulate a career or a path. Think about that person, whether it's Jesus, whether it's Martha King, whether it's Tim Tebow. Yeah, like, right, right. yeah, school teacher, your parents. Like, if, if they were here watching you right now, would they be proud? Mm. And that should change how you react, how you, how you consider, forgive, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that, if that's our reminder to, to stay on our personal straight and narrow path. And like I said, everything that we learn ourselves, we share in the music. So that's what we think about. So like we offer that to everyone else to think about as well. Yeah, I love that. I think that's such a cool way to like approach every single day. Yeah. Because I, 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 the way I approach every single day is kind of the name of the podcast. I think like, what's the best version of myself look like? How can I get closer to that yeah. person? But it's like, it's kind of a, it's just kind of a similar thought process. Right. Like you would want the best version of yourself to, to be proud of you and, and, and that sort of thing. And I think it's a really cool way. Do you, get, do, you, do you guys have, so you, are those your people that you, that you kind of like think about? And they, they, there's probably switches. There's, there's many, many people. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's, many. there's many. The reason that those two came up specifically was when we were first creating it, there was like, there's a lot of things happening in the country regarding police brutality. Mm-hmm. And obviously there's a lot of, there's still a lot of racial tension um, in every, in every facet of life right now. And so it was our way of reminding people not to take a side but to think with empathy mm-hmm. and think about it, what their actions are doing to make their respective heroes proud. And usually when you, when you dig deep enough, you find that the people who are some of the greatest speakers and leaders were all saying the same thing, <laughs> just to love yourself more and love your neighbors as yourself more yeah. and chill <laughs> and mind your business. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what most of them boils down to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you can, if you can get people to this, Think about that. A lot of times that in itself corrects the problems without you having to make new laws or beat over people's heads or, or you know, help others and, and discriminate against others. It it helps you just to live life in a way that's a little bit more, more non-problematic. Mm-hmm. What are you guys working on right now that you're most excited about? Is it like a piece of music or like an idea that you're thinking about that you're really excited about? Man, we're working on so much. So many I'm things. Sure. Um, I'm really excited about um, our girl band, The Shindellas. We're working on that album. We headed to the studio right now to, to do that. To yes. do that, but uh, super excited about what we're doing with them and why we're doing it with them. And so, um, I'm excited. Also, that we're doing this uh, music oratorio with Kathy Lee Gifford, and we're going to Israel to shoot some footage on that. I'm super excited mm-hmm. about that because. Um, people get to see the spiritual side of us and that's mm-hmm. really prevalent in what Weirdo Workshop is that's really prevalent in what Louis Shork is and so just being able to showcase that side of, of us is really exciting to me yeah and, and besides that we like we just we literally just just yesterday finished um, wrapping up our creation with the Nashville Ballet yeah and that was like a fantastic and um Pretty much, almost pretty much sold out crowds three nights and people loving a totally different side of us, a creative fine art side of us. So we were planning more things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, we also just finished doing the Grand Ole Opry, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. And, we'll, and we're doing it again. They invited us back. So that was historic. And that's, you know, definitely making a mark. And we're, we're at a workshop is not just music. It's um, an event and a community based company of which music is a part. So we have a really awesome book club that's founded and, and kind of started in Nashville. It's like 500 people deep Jeez. in their membership in Nashville and about 800 deep throughout the country. 
and we're continuing to do that here. What's the tiny book? Tiny, tiny book club. You have to come, by the way. Yeah, yeah. come through. It's books under 200 pages. We meet there like every six weeks. I'm a big reader, as you might be. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, no, no, books, books are, I mean, we read and watch documentaries more than we actually do music, believe it or not. And those, the information from those books and those documentaries and things is what spurs the conversation that makes the songs. Yeah. So Tiny Book Club is actually the most important part because that's when we get to actually talk to people and learn new things and get taught things ourselves by their opinions. So a lot of that and um, just getting behind a lot of cultural products that we're passionate about, both in film and TV and that kind of stuff, which is a big part of Weirdo Workshop as well, mm-hmm. is pushing culture forward through our podcasts and um, our We Sound Crazy. And we're really about making sure that people don't leave the importance of art behind in this we're moving fast. We're, we're going ahead really fast. Yeah. Technology is flying us forward. And we can't lose the human touch or the artistic touch yeah. in the process. So that's that's our mission. Actually, before before I ask the last couple questions, uh, is there like a maybe one of those songs on American Grio where there's a, like a line or phrase that you guys want to like sing real quick in, into the mic? Just people get a, get a little bit of a taste of it. Like maybe one of your favorite lines from one of those favorite songs that oh, people can get man. a little taste of it. There's so many. Yeah. Let's pick one um, from one of the favorite songs. Okay, so uh, Teach Me a Song is one of my favorite songs on the album. And it's a duo with Jimmy Allen. Yeah. And that's literally like a call to action for our, our musician friends to, to to make music that's meaningful. Yeah. I listened to that song yesterday. Yeah. I had Jimmy actually on the See? Podcast. Jimmy's a homie. Yeah. Uh, we do it together. It's, we do it at the Opry together. But don't get me wrong. It don't have to be long. But the words must be strong on the page. Cause I'm sick and tired of these colorful lies in the end. They've got nothing to say. Okay, would you teach me a song and I'll sing along? Yeah, yeah. I love those lines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just like get in, I'm like just fire, like fire up as they do. That's the kind of stuff, that, that's the kind of stuff we've been dreaming our whole life. Yeah, yeah. To be able really to say is. in music and be able to just say it's our music. Yeah. So that song is, is I mean, we, we're always just, I don't even believe this, but we're always in disbelief that we get to be the people that deliver this music to people yeah. because it's the music of our dreams. Yeah. Well, that's so, a great way to look at it. It keeps you, uh, thankful and yeah. you know, everything like that um sure. so i think that for me like i kind of said earlier i think it's really important to get clip in order to get closer to the best version of yourself to kind of gain a little bit of clarity of what that person could look like and kind of what that person should look like a little bit mm. um and try to my goal is to reverse engineer that person for mm. me like trying mm-hmm. to find a way to get closer to him um and so i think um a really important thing for me is to like figure out what does that guy know? What does that guy feel like mm-hmm. capable of and that sort of thing? So what I want to ask for you guys both individually is, is there for yourselves, is there a particular skill or a particular piece of knowledge that the best version of yourself has that you don't currently have? Oh, is there a skill that the best version of myself has that I don't currently ask have? <laughs> Ooh. You know, what's, what's funny about that is that I understand what you're saying about reverse engineering that, that person because that's kind of how I, how, how I view my life. Mm-hmm. I have this version of this myself, like my future self, and totally an old guy, you know. <laughs> but total old guy. <laughs> the, the vision of, of, of it is so prevalent in my mind that I go back to it often. And I'm not doing it. I'm literally... In a in an overcoat, and I'm I'm on this beach. It's just me. Nobody's there, and I'm just looking. That's the image I have of myself when I'm old, like 90, 92, 93, hopefully a hundred, but who knows? And when when I when I get that image in my mind, I I, look, I try to look at my eyes to see what it is that I know. And. So to answer your question, one of the things that I remember thinking about that that version of myself is that he truly knows that it really is all right. Like everything will be all right. Like 
all the worries that you have, all the goals that you have, whether you accomplish them or whether you don't accomplish them, in that moment when you're 90 and you, you're staring down the barrel of your finale, it's all right. You know what I'm saying? He lasted. He made it through. So it's all right. That's good. Wow, that is good. I have to end, I have to Sorry go. you have to go. I don't like that. <laughs> And that was like Damn, deep so- too. I know. It's true. That, that, that's awesome. True. I, I, I want to like take the time to actually sit down and like try to do that. Yeah. I, I, I don't even know what to say. The, I'm, I'm totally... Well, I, I'm trying to think of... Uh, there's many things in my head. Um, the old me... The, the future me, who's old and gray and wise... Um, He knows that he knows that uh, worrying doesn't solve anything. I think that's a battle that I that, that I don't like things I can't control, mm-hmm. and sometimes worry get worry takes control. Mm-hmm. And I think my my future self knows that uh, worry only creates more havoc. And so if you if you can remove it, then you can conquer anything. And I'll probably used to be sitting back when I'm an old man laughing at my, laughing at my younger self because I was worrying about silly things that didn't matter. Yeah, and that and that, that that that's that's the part of the, that's the part of life that I think I'm looking forward to is 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 the freedom to 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 see the the, the humor in all of this too. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. You're yeah. so because you can make it so intense. You realize like it's there's irony to this. Um, a lot of this is like laughing at yourself for being. So silly, so immature, so over overthinking it all. I think the old me is gonna be like, "You fool!" Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I think all of the, I think both of you all kind of comes down to like the self acceptance thing, the um, don't care what other people think about you. Right. 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 Exactly. That, it's all kind yeah. of encompassed in that in that message. Well, before I ask the last question, I want to acknowledge you guys. I think to be at, to be able to, I think y'all's energy transfers to the is probably gonna transfer to the microphone so well. Like I feel like people are gonna like feel super inspired and super just like touched by mm. y'all's words because you can tell how authentic it is and how thoughtful it is because both of you guys have obviously taken the time to kind of like be alone with yourself and really mm. ask yourself some really important questions and that has directed you in, in, and made you go along this path in such a, in a an effective way um, in such a, in a unique way. So I think that Y'all's ability to do that is super important and for you to be able to communicate the importance of it being like a unique journey and asking yourself those questions. I think that's just so important and so powerful. Thank, Thank you. you, man. Yeah, of appreciate course. that. Of course. Well, I know people are going to want to make sure they follow you and yes. of you guys more so where can they find you on Instagram? There's that Weirdo Workshop. You guys yes. have your individual account. Our company's called Weirdo Workshop. So all things Weirdo Workshop is at weirdoworkshop.com. You can actually get the hoodie Get the hoodies, the t-shirts, the, there's the there's bags, there's music, all kinds of stuff. But on social media, we love to hear from people because that's how we grow and we learn and, and we improve. So at Lewis York Music on everything, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube, mm-hmm. all that stuff. We're there. We, we answer back. We want, we comment back. We want to know what, what you're thinking and we share a lot of ourselves on there. So mm-hmm. between that and our company, Weirdo Workshop, you'll know where we're touring. When new music coming out, our tiny book club, our tiny book club, you can tiny sign up club. for it. Um, yeah, we're we're we're, we're a happy go lucky weirdo family in Ash- in Franklin, Tennessee. Yeah, and American Grizz on Spotify, it's yeah. everywhere. Spotify, everywhere. Apple, Title, all that stuff. Um, stream it, buy it, love it, share it. When are you guys going back on at Grand Ole Opry? March sixteenth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Very good. Well, good deal. Well. The last question is, I think that the best version of ourself is a constant journey mm-hmm. and a unique journey. I think the way that I'm going to become the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than you guys get the best version of yourself. Um, so my question for you is if you guys could currently do or work on three things to get closer to that guy sitting on the beach or that mm-hmm. uh, gray and wise. I'm sitting in a rocking chair. <laughs> <Yeah, there's three laughs> <things. laughs> what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on to get closer to that person? Time management, mm. better sleep, mm. 
and getting to the point faster. Mm. <laughs> there was yes. powerful. My mine would be um, cultivating a social life because I have none. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, eating better and eating worse and I mean just having a, a whole totally different relationship with food because I'm like I'm really hard on myself when it comes to what I eat and sometimes I need to chill and sometimes I need to actually go harder with, with my dietary things so just working that out mm -hmm. eating better and eating worse both of them and the last thing is, um, hmm, I don't know, man. Reading more. Reading more. Reading more. Well, you guys have a book club, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but sometimes, like, the book club is, is good for us because if we have to read the book, of course, and we read it multiple times. But it's also bad because you feel like, I never read my book, but I read my song. <laughs> so, 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 I don't have to put up another book, and, and so you kind of get lazy with reading it. I just feel like it's so much more knowledge, so mm -hmm. much more valuable information that I can gain by reading more. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, those are three great things. I appreciate it, guys. That's all we got. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. This was awesome. Super awesome. Yeah.